The other day I made a confession to my friends. It's a kind of secret that's so deep you don't even know that you're hiding it. There were only three people there for the confession, and one of them was a dog, so I felt like it didn't count. I needed to make it in front of more people. I wanted to make this confession for years, but felt like it would make me look like a really, really, really bad composter. My confession is worse than being divorced at 34. It's worse than having a shotgun wedding at 23 to someone I had only gone on one date with, and it was to the library. And I spent the majority of that date chasing him around the aisles, trying to find him. If only I had known that I could forever find him in fiction. <laughs> we also didn't talk much because he thought I was German and didn't speak English. The only reason I couldn't stop crying on my wedding day to even get down the aisle is because my brother kicked in the door to the women's farm bathroom and made me throw my wedding gloves that he referred to as the ugliest things he had ever seen in the trash. The tears weren't about my husband-to-be. All that was fine. He's great. My bridesmaids weren't doing the normal thing that day of telling the bride how beautiful she is, and they definitely didn't block the barn door for my mom's random friends that kept yanking on the ribbons of my dress and fixing my pixie bangs. As soon as the barter band started looping Canon and D on the ukulele, I told them, hold on, I have to pee. And of course, like, they all got in front of the door and they said, no, you can't, you can't pee. And that is literally the worst thing to say to a bride and a pregnant bride. <laughs> so of course, that is what caused the convulsive tears. Half the guests didn't show up to our wedding anyway because I had picked Bartram's Garden, which is a wonderland amidst the most impoverished neighborhood of Philadelphia as the venue, and guests had to step over the guy getting cuffed face down at the entrance. The New Jersey contingent literally just drove home before the wedding. So, you ready for my confession? Yeah. All right. I don't like leftovers. I'm the founder of Compost Business, and I don't like leftovers. I'll swat that cold pizza away from your mouth. I'll recycle all the Tupperware containers my mom keeps buying me after she visits and aggressively throw slightly dented fruit into the compost bin. You can leave. <laughs> so I stood next to Hugh Atchison once at the second annual school lunch challenge, and I accidentally stole his Brussels sprouts. He was moving his knife around slowly on his cutting board, and for some reason I just thought the vegetables were already ready for the compost. So he saw me and he pushed his glasses down a bit and he said, uh, he said, I need those. Can you give them back? And so I did. <laughs> There's a video of me taken right after giving birth to my first daughter and the midwife asks if I want to keep the afterbirth. I firmly shake my head, no. No leftovers for me. We're done. I compost too much. Most people have one bit at the curb and I have five. A couple of years ago, I was invited to be a speaker at a food waste symposium at UGA. Two days before the symposium, I got an email that said, I'm sorry, we feel that your mission is not aligned with ours, and we found someone else. It turned out that the event was focused on rescuing food, not composting food, and that food waste specifically meant still edible food that is not given to people that are hungry. Because I was a composter, I could not adequately speak about food rescue or hungry people. I felt really hurt at the time, dejected, and isolated from my own cause somehow. I wish I had known at the time that the roots of my identity as a composter are really in rescued food, and wish I'd been able to confidently tell her that food rescue and food composting are soul sisters, like Brad and I. <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> but it's only this year that that connection became clear. Growing up in California, we didn't compost, and the only gardening I remember was strawberries the size of Altoids in my grandmother's teeny yard. Other than eating not quite ripe raspberries from the back of the schoolyard and witnessing a grapefruit roar with my brothers in the backyard, my childhood was beautiful, but definitely not filled with dirt, worms, or plants. Even when the one hamster and two rats died, I had no idea where they went. I still don't really know. In high school, my house was known for having the best snacks around, and I think it's because of this that my friends were always at our house and that I didn't get into trouble once. I learned the forever lesson that good food supply is the foundation of peace and a strong moral code in the world. My mom taught me that. She didn't say that exactly, but that's what she meant. <laughs> I didn't grow up as an earth lover or vegan, green person. All that came later. I'm not vegan. I just, my hair. <laughs> as it turned out, our leftovers growing up were used as the base in such new fantastic meals, often called a salad or a casserole, that we had no idea the ingredients weren't brand new. So maybe it was there, deep down, fed, dressed up in leftovers, that I was fed by compost my whole life. Food waste is defined by food that is discarded, lost, or uneaten. In 2016, social responsibility became a key tenant 
of growing businesses. And companies like Kroger, Walmart, and Target all cite food waste reduction goals as a major priority. Here is a direct quote from Walmart's corporate website. They must have gotten the best intern in the world to write this, but here we go. This is from Walmart. With the world's population expected to reach 9 billion people by 2050, the global waste problem is expected to grow as well, unless we change course. The World Bank estimated that the world produced 3.5 million tons of solid waste per day in 2010, and that amount is projected to double by 2025. That's not simply a lot of trash. It's a lot of lost value. As much as $2.6 trillion annually in raw materials and residual worth. Landfill waste is a double loss, wasted product and wasted natural resources to produce the product in the first place. The world can't afford to use up water, forests, food, minerals, fossil fuels, or any natural resource in this way. At Walmart, we've been attempting to reduce waste in our operations because we hate waste of any kind. End quote. Sometimes the best sermons come from very unusual places. In college, my friend Adam was eating a red apple, and halfway through he said, why would I not enjoy this just because it's going to be over soon? He insisted on eating the whole thing, stem, seeds, and all. Imagine a beautiful peach tree at the origin. And at the end of that long path to the hungry person, there's just a tiny bite, a tiny peach eaten from the whole tree. Imagine that bountiful tree thrown in the trash. That's food waste. Imagine that tree covered in a massive plastic bag. Imagine gathering up your neighbors and shoving that plastic-covered tree into the most expensive hole in the ground that is also lined with plastic. Then dump couches and televisions and old shoes and my wedding gloves and suitcases full of taxpayer money on that tree so it has no room to breathe or break down. Cover that up with dirt using inmate labor to hide the true cost so that no one questions the mound as they play golf on top of it. That's a landfill. And that's what we're doing with 51% of the food waste in America. Food waste is about three things, hunger, soil, and money. Over the years, my company, Let Us Compost, has actually been at odds with food recovery groups in Athens. They have thought we're stealing food from the food banks and hungry people, and we've thought that they don't value our composting efforts. In 2012, there were a couple different groups that were picking up food from food waste from 10 or 12 restaurants for free. They were the very restaurants whose missions would have aligned perfectly with Let Us Compost. There were buckets set out at various places, orange peels at one, coffee grounds at another, and never any meat, dairy, or plate scrapings. The pickups were random, often done in a sedan by volunteers on different days. Many times the food waste would sit out too long and start to rot on site. Other times the opposite issue happened. The free food pickups were done so fantastically and regularly that there was no need for our service. Upon discovery that Let Us Compost comes with a fee, we were met with hostility, assumptions of insane greed, accused of vertical integration, or in better days, just a laugh. As a tiny grassroots company creating not just a new service, but a new composting model that didn't fit into anything that existed at the time, it was incredibly frustrating to fight against people that were doing something for free, nothing is ever really free, or doing composting so badly that it took years for the memories of these experiences to leave the minds of business owners in Athens. I had to convince business owners to do something they didn't want to do in the first place, and they convinced them to pay for that very thing that they didn't want to do. <sighs> Compost service is the hardest thing to sell in the world. I'm jealous of Kylie lip kits every day. <laughs> I'm jealous of LOL dolls and Chaco sandals. I'm jealous of gasoline and coffee and beer and any type of moisture wicking pants. In 2012, composting was the thing that no one wanted and no one wanted to pay for. Thanks to amazing supporters in Athens. In 2019, composting is something that most people want and a couple hundred will pay for. In the next decade, it's my hope that composting is something that everyone wants and will value enough to pay for. And my true hope is that composting will become cheaper than trash and a creator of better soil, that it will truly become a normal part of society. Let Us Compost has come a long way. The other day, I was at an outdoor Filipino dinner, and a French woman told me how much she hates America, but she loves Let Us Compost. She said, oh yeah, I love your service. I throw it in my friend's bin down the street every day. <laughs> She's using the service, but not paying for it. <laughs> but yeah, on a bad day, all I want to sell is Spanx. As an aside, our initial logo was designed by the same designer who did all the cute underwear illustrations for the Spanx ads. <laughs> it's a shame that I constantly take the path that's so close to being profitable, but completely not. <laughs> After college, I moved back home to Palo Alto, California, and made a tiny room for myself under the stairs at my parents' house and surrounded myself with videos from Red Door Rentals. I made a great living babysitting and serving at a cafe and had basically zero expenses. When Red Door video rentals closed and my skin erupted in rashes from the insulation under the stairs, my enthusiasm for tiny rooms wore off 
and I moved into the cheapest room I could find on Craigslist at a place called Magic. I lived in a one-room yurt amongst a bunch of other houses set up like a commune, and the whole room was basically a Murphy bed that couldn't be raised. It was just always down, and my few belongings lived under the bed. A tiny skylight was in the room, and I had tons of time to read and stare at the little bugs surrounding the skylight. Years later, I learned that I was famous for being the one person that was so happy in the termite house. While there was no pedagogy imposed on the residents, it was encouraged that we eat dinner together and occasionally do this thing called yoga. Half of my rent was paid for by the labor of chopping up and freezing vegetables and fruit foraged by the unsellables at the Palo Alto Farmer's Market and harvesting plums from the six trees on site so they didn't rot on the ground. 80% of what we ate for dinner was essentially wasted food from the farmer's market. The rest was lentils and rice bought in bulk and stored in the basement. Dinners were salad with hippie dressing, hot lentils and rice, and a pot of vegetables. It was the exact same thing every day. The family that started magic biked everywhere and planted trees on the weekend. They sustained themselves on wasted food, they made the air better with trees, and they composted everything they didn't eat in a bin in the backyard. One of them even walked around naked most of the time. It was just on the porch, just one guy. <laughs> they were so happy and brought in residents to experience that happiness in this weird way of life that seemed insanely normal. Because typical rooms in the area rented for $2,500 a month, people were drawn to magic because of the cheap rent. And because of that, everyone was so different from one another. It's this house and this experience that I'm constantly inspired by, and as the years go by, they inspire me more. A couple years ago, I donated $50 to, this, to Magic, which is in California, and I got a call from the founder, and she said, Hi, this is Hillary from Magic. Someone from Athens donated $50, and I wanted to see who it was because I grew up there. I said, Hillary, this is Kristen. Remember, I used to live with you. I moved to Athens. It turns out that the founder of this California commune actually grew up in the Cedar Creek neighborhood of Athens. <laughs> So she ended up telling me all the great places to take my kids, like Watson Mill Park and Sandy Creek Beach. Hillary taught me about living the world you want to see, and doing it like a ballet dancer, with a smile, and living it so naturally you never really talk about it, because it's all really fun. She taught me about rescuing food and composting, and it's because of her that the obsession with food waste has never left. This year, I got invited to a Food Shed UGA meeting, the amazing people that put on this event, and it was incredibly exciting to be in a group full of food recovery superstars water and soil experts, and genius facilitators. We can all finally work together as a cohesive unit, bring UGA's magic spilling out into the greater Athens community, and let us compost can finally include food recovery in its mission by aligning with groups that are already doing this good work. Even though I don't like cold pizza, food should always go to people that are hungry first, then animals, then industrial uses, and be composted last. We are the last line of defense before the landfill, and any army is stronger with alliances. I met with Brad from Campus Kitchen one morning on the Funny Blocks hipster chairs, A Thousand Faces. And in his understated, calm way, he told me about all the happy moments and successes he's had feeding people with Campus Kitchen. He told me about the families he meets and the meticulous way his group preps food and how they are laser focused on their mission and always have funding left over because of it. The conversation with him opened up my heart after all these years and flooded my mind with memories of the magic commune, reminding me that all this work is important and hard. and We desperately need that camaraderie to get through it. You'll hear from him next. We need a lot from you as a community. And at this point, it's not enough to like what we do, if you like what we do. It's going to need to be paying for lettuce compost service, supporting policies that provide incentives for business owners and residents to compost, and most of all, choosing to spend money at the businesses that subscribe to lettuce compost service. When you go out to dinner, ask if they compost. You'll be shocked at how many people say no. If you compost in your backyard, you're the perfect person to do a residential subscription. We can pick up the meat, bones, dairy, plate scrapings, paper plates, and napkins that you can't compost in your backyard. If you are a business owner, it costs nothing for you to find out more information. And I guarantee that I'll buy snacks from you at our consultation. Because my mom taught me that snacks are the key to peace and a strong moral code in the world. Thank you. When we look at the subject of food waste, it can be pretty dark. I'm taking, I'm stealing a little bit of Anthony Bourdain's thunder, as you'll get to see in this great film. Uh, this is something that can, this is a subject that if you look at, it can really make you think, wow, like, you know, how, what rights do we to be stewards over, over land? What rights do we have to be able to, to be able to have so much abundance, at least in this, at least in this country? And as Christian pointed out, the road, the road ahead to figure out how we repurpose 
and bring back and how we rec repurpose food and recycle everything is going to take more than liking it. It's going to it's going to take it's going to take a, li a little bit of something from each of us. And sometimes when you're facing a problem that can be really really scary and really big and have a lot of different heads to, heads to the monster, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And we sometimes, or at least in my mind, you the it can be it can be helpful to think of the vision like your magic. Think of some place some place that's a really powerful memory for you and something that you believe is still still brings joy and life and happiness. And we can oftentimes and we can oftentimes look for things that are very far away. And what but what I just want to say is that the very the very encouraging things are happening right around us in our own midst. You'll hear stories and hear and see stories in the film about about movements that are going on all over the world. But I just want to hit the highlights of what's going on right now, to the best of my knowledge. Um, you know, if you're looking for inspiration around here about what's being what's being done with food recovery, I'm talking strictly repurposing uh, repurposing food and redistributing it for the for um, to be consumed by humans. You know, you don't need to look further than the food bank of Northeast Georgia, who has re recovered over two million pounds of food in the last calendar year um, from major grocery stores in our region, and that were then made accessible to nonprofit partner agencies. You, know, you don't need to look any further. And as Kristen alluded to, one of the food bank's major donors, Kroger, who recently celebrated 10 years of their store donation program to local food banks. In 2018, Kroger, Kroger among other companies, um, uh, launched their Zero Hunger, Zero Waste plan, redoubling their efforts to develop food waste solutions in their stores and to partner with local communities to develop a $10 million innovation fund um, to develop food waste solutions. You don't need to look much further than the full plate program of Action Incorporated of Athens, uh, who has been working since 1987 to, to recover prepared foods for rapid pickup from UGA's dining facilities, chain restaurants like Starbucks, Red Lobster, Outback, as well as local establishments like Epting Events and Kappa Alpha Theta Sorority, to name only a few. With only two full-time staff members and two vans, Full Plate moved over 20, 200,000 pounds of highly perishable food around Athens, Clark County and the surrounding areas in 2018. You also don't look, need to look much further than the Grow It Note program, where AmeriCorps National Service members and, and Clark County School District middle schoolers are working together to create a culture of food sustainability. During the 2017 school year, the Grow It Note program collected over 11,000 pounds of compost, recycled over 3,000 pounds of waste, and routed more than 3,300 pounds of fresh fruit to hungry students rather than the trash can. And you don't need to look much further than the Campus Kitchen program at UGA, where a team of 45 trained volunteer student leaders recovered 45,000 pounds from grocery stores and local agriculture outlets, the Athens Farmers Market, and the Collective Harvest CSA program. Then those donations were transformed into 12,000 from scratch meals and 29,000 pounds of groceries. And students delivered those products directly to food insecure families across the county um, and to area nonprofits. I've had the privilege of serving as the coordinator for the past four years. I wanna tell you briefly about, about, briefly about something, about two people who got to meet this week and will be continuing to meet for the rest of the, rest of the semester. Uh, Rebecca Richardson, became the primary, primary caregiver of her three young grandchildren about a decade ago after her daughter passed away. In 2016, the family enrolled in the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren program at the Athens Community Council on Aging. And as part of, and as part of their holistic intake process, food insecurity was identified as one of their needs. Their referral form came across my desk. We added them to a delivery route, and the next week they started getting campus kitchen meals and groceries. Fast forward to Fast forward two years from that date, they started getting uh, meals and groceries, um, meals and groceries every week, thanks to a new collaboration with the Food Bank of Northeast Georgia, where we took on an additional pickup from them, so that they don't need to, so that they could send their paid drivers to better concentrate on larger stores. It truly does take a united, a united front of of all different organizations with different assets. This week, this week. Uh, Madison Drummond, a third-year sports communication and PR major, visited Ms. Richardson on her weekly delivery route. 
Madison had committed to delivering for an entire academic semester. She presented to the family with children and grandmother alike eagerly awaiting a prepared meal of scallops, rice, and mixed vegetables, and a grocery bag of U Garden collard greens, eggs, potatoes, bread, and apples. Madison stayed for a minute to talk to them about their week and soon was on her way to the next stop. With a parting word of, see you, see you guys next week, and smiles all around. So Madison was looking for a way to be more involved in her community and heard about us through a friend. And Re Rebecca was looking for a way to try to provide a richer, more supportive environment for her family. And she says of, a, of the program and of the students, they provide, they help out those in need so, so that they can focus on other problems. People have many worries in Campus Kitchen takes one of those off our minds. Wendell Berry once said that eating is an agricultural act. I wanna add that food recovery <coughs> is a redemptive act. Working with Campus Kitchen has taught me my own definition of what it means to redeem something. I'm not talking about covering over, um, covering over the bad aspects of something or um, talking about the payment or the sacrifice that it takes to do something. To redeem, in my view, is to state by deliberate, repeated action, the intrinsic, unalienable, good value of something the value of something that was there the whole time, regardless of whether, you, of whether you're bruised, banged up, expired, or some other, or some other label. Food recovery for me used to, used to only mean affirming that waste is wrong and it's not smart. Good, I think we're all there by now. Yes, but I increasingly am convicted that it also means that, means that food recovery means that, that affirming that food is good and all of your neighbors are incredibly special. I'm doing what I'm doing because I believe that, and I believe love speaks clearly through redemptive work. And that's what I want people to know when they, when they work with our program. So you're watch about, about to watch a great film that I hope will leave you inspired and ready to take some next steps, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, all these organizations and more, I gave a really incomplete list, are all great places to start. So I hope this has been of use to you. And thank you, and hope you enjoy the show. Thank you.